actually Okay, I, it's funny when I say that, and then I think about the words I'm going to say immediately afterwards, it's like, and welcome to, you know? <laughs> which of course we've already been talking for five minutes. Um, this is, the cornerstone of this is a conversation that I had with uh, Lance and Cassiano, and we're going to go ahead and just get started with them telling us about some of the projects, hopefully they have something to show us, which in Lance's case can't be all virtual. You got real projects, right? Yeah, so what I, I just, I, you know, I don't want to disappoint, but I just have a bunch of photos. Perfect. Um, it's going to be great. Lined up. Going to be great. It's not Nothing groundbreaking but that's cool that's great so Cassiano why don't you go ahead and uh, kick this off with uh, whatever you want you have to share yeah yeah uh, thanks a lot Trev, for, for the invite um, and the opportunity to share a little bit of the work I apologize in advance you guys may may hear some of my my little girl screaming from time to time so I have nice. uh, eight months old so today is exactly eight months <laughs> so, so I know that right on cue. Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't Marty, right? That was that was your daughter, right? That okay, was my good. daughter. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, oh yeah, from time to time she's gonna be uh, cranky. It's almost time to sleep. So uh, soon enough she. Not important. Now. Not important. But um, so the idea here, when, when Travis mentioned about uh, it's. Uh, um, um, it's just to show some of the work that have been done. I, I need to be honest, uh, I just started, uh, I believe that Lens also is relatively new on this, so I don't have much work to show. I have a little bit, I can show a little bit of my workflow. So I have prepared a little bit, of, uh, a few slides just to show more or less what, what I have done. Um, of course, I start before, uh, well, we start like end of the last year and I was, had some projects in mind. I had some projects in my parking lot, but with everything that's happened, and I can't do in my apartment here right now, so I just mm. uh, stuck with the project that I already have done. So just to kick us off, um, let me just share my screen to, to show um, exactly. So I have managed, I have uh, many meetings online and I have managed uh, a lot of different- um, Oh, different systems? Yeah. Systems, yes. Yeah, so up at the top of your screen? Yeah, it's, let me just do what. Uh, hopefully, it's not something that I'm keeping you from doing. Let me just take a quick peek here. No, I think it's uh, for some reason. Oh, I, I probably need to grant access. Let me just grant access through the the software. I don't think that I have used it, uh, the Zoom on this computer in particular. I have my, my work okay. computer. So I have just made it possible for multiple participants to share simultaneously. Uh, let me try one other thing too, which is. Can you can you share the screen now or can you not? Yeah, no, I think I just need to grant access to it. Let me just grant access really quickly. Yeah. I think that's now I should be able to do it. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, nice. Okay, so just to kick off, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell uh, much, I, I'm not an expert on, on the matter, so I'm not gonna tell much about how to do it or the, the principles of epoxy. Uh, to be honest, I understand the, just a little bit of it. And the reason why I started is just because I found some work online, I found that that's really nice and I would like to reproduce it. Um, uh, so I decided to do some of these small projects that's gonna be showing. Uh, just before I go there, I know that there's different ways to do it as everything in woodworking, right? So um, again, not an expert in, in, in epoxy resin. The reason why I picked this epoxy in particular is the one that is showing here is because it have had good reviews on Amazon. That was the only reason. Uh, I know that there's many different ones. This is a casting epoxy. Again, it was just for small projects that we're doing. Uh, I pick because of the reviews is a low odor, self leveling and high gloss epoxy. I usually prefer high gloss stuff, so that's why I decided to do it. And it's a very clear epoxy. It's uh, equal parts of A and B, three to five minutes of mixing, 30 minutes of workout, of work time, and then 24 hours to cure. So um, it, it used to come, when I bought it, it just came with, uh, with a collection of pigments, but I just, uh, try to take the picture, uh, the image from the Amazon website, and I realized that they don't sell with the color collection anymore. I, I don't know why. Oh. But you can 
buy the pigments online and just mix. So everything that I'm gonna be showing uh, is color pigments that I mix with the color pigments that came, we used to came with the pots, but you can buy different. Hmm. And just a disclaimer, uh, disclaimer, I have, this is just my experience. I do not receive any incentive to use this particular pox. And the thing is you can achieve results with any pox. So I'm not advocating that you need to buy this one or anything. It's just like, I don't receive anything. It's, uh, Except just so you know, you recommended this kit to me and I only bought it about a month ago and it came mm -hmm. with all sorts of pigments still. Yeah. So maybe they're just out of it right now, but yeah. it was a maybe. great kit. Yeah, maybe because of the, all the logistical distribution with the right. coronavirus, maybe they change it. Uh, but yeah, um, the other thing that I noticed that a lot of people use different from what I'm doing with Epox, and, and usually most of the, the, pro, the, of the recommendations people say don't use this, is a heat gun. So I do use a heat gun to pop up the bubbles. A lot of people use um, um, just a flame gun, right? Um, one of the reasons why people don't recommend the heat gun is because it blows air and you can blow epoxy everywhere is not my particular experience of that. I think it works quite well, but can get the epoxy quite hot. So you need to be careful to don't be in one particular spot for too long. Right. Um, so it's um, oh, just a second, guys. Yeah. Hello. Oh, by the way, this, this is my, my, daughter, my wife and my lovely daughter, so uh, <laughs> I love it. Hey, say hi, Hannah. Hey. Happy, happy eighth month birthday. <laughs> hey, say hi. Yeah. <laughs> she, she's, yeah, she's happy. Um, so uh, this is my workflow, but usually what I do. Um, uh, the first thing is I transfer my design to the digital, and this step, I, I try to anticipate problems, uh, as anyone in woodwork, right? Before you start to do it, we try to anticipate where we're going to have a problems and so on. There's not many caveats of doing this, or many problems that you can do it. I engrave the wood, but before I do the engraving the wood, uh, I usually run passes uh, with the same wood because uh, the depth of the laser can vary from wood to wood. So I have tests like bamboo, maple, uh, uh, walnut, and you can see that uh, depending on the speed and the power of the laser, you can have different depth. And if, when you engrave, this, this, this depth that's gonna hold the resin, right? So we need to make sure that just to have the right depth so uh, it's not too shallow uh, to, to pour the, the resin. So and is your experience basically putting recesses in wood using the laser, that's your technique? Yes. Okay. Yes. A wide laser is just uh, just worked well, out really nicely for yeah. me. It was my first time was with the laser, so I thought, hey, I mean, if it works with the laser, uh, the workflow of the laser I thought that's a little bit easier than the CNC right now uh, for for this particular uh, thing. I think that's right. uh, because you just need to create a recess. Uh, I think the, the laser works nicely. Great. Uh, so. so. Especially if you have like these small, if you have very small details, uh, you don't have the risk of uh, chipping it off with the laser. So it makes, uh, it can be very detailed this uh, with the laser. Hey, Cassiano, uh, Marty had a question for you. Yeah. Marty? I, think, I think they're in mute, uh, Marty. Oh, really? But there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, how big is, how deep is the recess? So it's, it all depends on, I never really measure it, but when, in my tests, I just try to see like as deep as, for example, if the wood is really thin, you don't want it too deep, of course, right? Uh, but remember that you're gonna be sanding down. So one of my workflows is sanding this down. So it cannot be also uh, a very, very thin piece of wood, right, that you're gonna be doing. Uh, but it is enough that can hold the box and kind of create some groove to the box to stay there in place. Especially if you have a lot of details on the wood, I would recommend that uh, you go a little bit deep. Um, I don't know what, maybe a one six. But so enough three. so that it's deep enough to hold the resin, but there's uh, also deep enough so you can sand off a layer and not affect yeah. the resin. Okay. Yes. So like a millimeter, two millimeters? Yeah, two millimeters. Two, yeah. two millimeters, yeah. Okay. You, you made it very easy to me to compare because sometimes I'm, uh, in the interior in scale for me is kind of hard. But yeah, in the, the metric, yes, uh, two or three million numbers, uh, I think so, it'd be great. Okay. Uh, so 
uh, pour les pox, prepare the pox. If you're doing the mix, just do the mix there. Uh, pour les pox. Um, I usually try to avoid when we're mixing the pox to create too much bubbles. So the less, less bubbles that you create during the mixing, less bubbles you have to pop out after you pour it. Um, uh, after I pour the pox, I pop the bubbles of the heat gun. What I realized is that as the heat gun uh, hits the pox, also there's a lot of bubble that surface from the wood probably uh, as well. So you can see a lot of bubbles surfacing, probably comes from the wood itself. Hmm. Um, and, but when I pour, I, I try to make sure that I pour also a few millimeters above um, the recess. So when I send down, most of the, the bubbles, they came to the surface and you're gonna stay in the surface. So when I send down that, uh, the, 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 the layer below, not gonna have too much, yeah. too many bubbles. So my experience of that, it, it works quite nicely. I don't have an experience. So when I was doing this, the first time that I did, I tested, I tested with the heat gun, without the heat gun. And the one that was without the heat gun, when I send down, even the layers below, there was a lot of bubbles. Uh, so they did, did not come up. So I think as the heat gun, it helped like first, the, make the bubbles a little bit big and, and, and the pox a little bit more fluid so the bubbles could uh, go up. Yeah. Um, and without the heat gun, I, I, I did see a lot of bubbles. I don't think that was from the pox itself. I think it was mostly also from the wood because when we were mixing, I didn't see too many bubbles there. So, so it sounds as though you put in enough so it swells a little bit. It's a little bit above the surface. Do you do anything to keep it from spreading too far out? Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, I think it's one of my pictures that they should have, but I put tape around just tape. to make sure that's not going to mix or not going to go around too much. If, okay. if there is like chances of mixing or so, otherwise it, stay, it is level, if your piece of work is level, and at this stage it should be level, um, it usually stays in place as well, it doesn't, doesn't go uh, too often. Do you put the tape on before you do the etching or do you put it on afterwards? I put before, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so it's, really it's really precise. Yeah. Got it. Okay, good. So um, after do the uh, set level, uh, 24 hours to, to cure, send out the excess epoxy, fine sand the wood and the epox, and apply a finish layer, right? So um, I'm going to show some of the examples that I have done. Uh, the only thing that I would advise is that don't overheat the sample with the heat gun. This is very easily achievable. I, 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 I did myself, uh, if you just stay in the same place or if you stay for too long, passing through. So uh, you can see the, the, the epox change in the, the texture and the fluid and don't want too much of that. Does it harden? Is that what you see? No, it's too it did not. It, it stay in fact more fluid. And for example, we can spread more, especially if we don't have the tape boundary, yeah. it, can, it can spread this more. So you need to be careful of that as well. If you, if you hit too much, it may spread a little bit too much as well. So it yeah. becomes more viscous when it gets hot and spreads by itself? It, 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 I think it becomes less viscous when, when it got hot. So it starts to spread because, because if it, if the heat gun is, is a blow of air, right? So when we're blowing the air, it starts like to move to the sides as we blow in one direction yeah. and the other direction goes to the other side. So usually I, I change the direction just to make sure that stay more or less the same place. Okay. Uh, but because it's more fluid because of the heat, now it, it, it can go farther uh, um, from, from your piece of, uh, uh, of art, right? So you need to make sure that you keep some that boundary. And so so mm -hmm. that's why when the tape it around, usually it makes it easier because the epo epox cannot go anywhere. If you don't tape it, they, it, it may go to places that you don't want to go. Right. So just, uh, just be careful there. Okay. Luciano, do you happen to know the temperature of your heat gun? Um, I don't know. So the heat gun is the same one that I show in the picture there. And I was hoping that it would show the temperature. I, I pr probably can email later uh, because uh, what happened is that the new heat gun now has two levels uh, oh. of heat. So they also changed the heat gun that they use. So probably uh, uh, there was some, uh, some change since uh, um, uh, I bought. Um, so I, I don't have it, but I, I need to, to look into the original manual. I need to find the original manual and I, I can see what's the temperature there. Why don't we try uh, the audience? Does anybody know what the a good temperature for a heat gun is if you're going to be using it to get the bubbles out? I I don't know about the numbers, but I have a heat gun that has a low and a high setting. I found that more importantly, the high setting blows the more air. Oh. It's not a, so it's 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 almost like you don't have a choice because 
if you put it on the high setting, you're going to move it around too much. Got it. So it sounds like that high and low is more the speed of the fan than the temperature. It's probably both, but I think when you, like the concern is that you're, you know, you really don't want it to move. Got so it. on the high setting, I don't know if it's the same with you, Cassiano, but with the high setting, it's just too, it's, you know, it's moving around too much. So I, managed, I managed to find one where you can set the temperature independently of the fan. Oh, Tim's getting fancy on us. Right. I'm sure that exists. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Hey, Travis, I have the uh, I have the Harbor Freight uh, two-speed heat gun. The lower temperature is 750. The uh, high temperature is 1500. And uh, and like Lance said, it's got the two-speed. When you do kick it to the 1500, the uh, fan the blower motor speeds up, and uh, to help, to keep it from melting, basically. So, do you use the low power? Uh, it, when you're doing your resin, it it really depends on the depth of the resin that I'm pouring. Okay. If it's deeper, I'll use the higher heat so it can get down further. Okay. But if it's so shallow, I'll just use the low speed. So you're not as concerned about the power of the blower. You're really just trying to get all the resin warmed up so all the bubbles come up. Yes. Got it. Yeah, okay. exactly. I, I don't, you can I don't back use, it off. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't use a heat gun at all. I use a propane torch. Mm -hmm. And you don't even touch the flame to the epoxy. You just kind of brush it across. So I don't think it's really looking for heat, a lot of heat. It just needs enough to pop those bubbles as they come up. And yeah. it causes bubbles to come up from down to lower. Mm -hmm. um, Is it the same torch you use when making creme brulee? Very similar, but mine's a big and more of an industrial type choice. <laughs> you see, you're, you're <laughs> bring your creme brulee. If you <laughs> but, but it's real easy to use, and then there's no wind, there's no blowing, so the epoxy's not getting moved around at all. You're just you're just moving that torch across the surface, not even straight up and down, just kind of at an angle, and and the bubbles start popping. Great, yeah. Thank you. It, it, I think it's most of the, the, the videos that I watched before I did uh, mine, they really recommend the torch and they say, don't use a heat gun, use a torch. The reason why I, I use the heat gun is because I, I didn't have the torch and I started to use the heat gun and it worked and sometimes it just worked. But I'm, I'm sure that uh, what I have heard is that the torch uh, is way faster as well. It's just like pass and it's done uh, and it works great as well. So. You have to make sure, though, that you're in a clean environment, that you're not surrounded by a bunch of dust, because yep. if you're blowing, that dust is going to get into your epoxy. Yes. That's, and that's I, I was going to mention this later, but I have both, and it, the, the way I would choose between the two is the size of the project. Mm -hmm. The reason I got a torch instead of the, I had an e-gun, I ended up getting a torch, is just the size of the project. If you have a large project, the, the, the heat gun is just, it's not, it, I mean, you can, it's fine, but it's way better to use a torch uh, if it's larger, so. Interesting, yeah. Okay. Good, thank you. And, okay, so just going back, uh, one thing that I, well, we already discussed about the can is the, because I'm using the laser, when we're, you, would, you engrave it with the laser, you burn the, the wood, right, basically. And there is this smoke that's deposited on the wood. Um, what I noticed is that this smoke can mix with the resin and it kind of makes a, grad, a darker gradient from the, the, the border exactly where is, is the wood that was, was born and your, uh, your resin. So kind of mix a little bit and there's a, a darker gradient there a, a little mm. bit. Uh, so just to be aware, I, I didn't try to brush that off or to clean. Uh, one thing that I thought about doing as well, maybe do a coating that would hold that down or separate the, the smoke from the uh, uh, from the resin. I didn't try to do any, uh, any of this, uh, but that's to put in consideration if you use the laser to do uh, the, uh, the engraving in the, in the wood. And another thing is uh, this particular resin that we use, this casting re resin that I use, uh, was very easy to send out. I was surprised to be honest, the first time that I did it. Uh, I would just start with a low grade and go uh, a finer one uh, as you send out. But it was 
was quite easy. If you use an 80, for example, you can't set down most of it, or I start with 40 if I pour a little bit too much, or, or if it's a big project, just to, to go a little bit faster, but it goes, goes down uh, relatively easy. Uh, so just just to show, so this is the, the laser engraving process uh, that I'm doing. Um, these are three different uh, woods that we're doing. Uh, this is a uh, maple, the first one in the video. Uh, there is bamboo, that's this bear here. Uh, and there is, uh, this is walnut here as well. So also different um, uh, uh, heights of the wood. So I was adjusting. I usually test to see which one they're gonna be using, uh, which power and speed of the laser gonna be using to do it. So um, after the engraver, I do the, the pouring. So this is the, the bear here. Uh, this is a, a, a table. Um, and these are coasters that are doing with the Game of Thrones here as well. So I did different colors. So here I delimitate with the, uh, with the tape to do it, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing the heat can. Uh, to remove the bubbles. This is going to move around, so just to make sure that it doesn't go in places that you don't want it to go. I'm sorry, Cassiano, on the multicolored board there, are those all separate projects? Are they like five different coasters, or are they each different um, house of land so or whatever? And there are five, or? Yeah, there are these five different coasters here. So because because the coaster is quite small, I didn't want to cut before I do the uh, sanding. Everything's just make like easier for me to to sand with a bigger piece than cut after a sanding. So it. that's why I, I did it all together. But is our these ones here? So uh, okay. uh, yeah. So I just I just uh, pour in the panel here. To just make sure that the limitate to, to be on the where they should be. So what we see on the bottom left is after the etching. And yes. so all the dark is the burn from the etching. And yep. that is all going to be filled in with the colors you have in the upper yep. right. Okay, yep. great. thank you. And, and, and you can note here that I did not use tape to, to prevent the laser from smoking on the side because you're gonna be sanding anyway. So right. that is you're gonna be removing anyway. So I didn't do that. Okay. Um, you can see that all of them, they have it here, but after you sand this down, you, you, you don't see it. Um, so this is after sanding, in fact. So this is the same ones uh, after sanding. So so I, I just finished sanding here. I didn't clean, so you can see that's kind of uh, still not showing off, but at least it's working. Uh, and here was a, the test that I did that I didn't use the heat gun on this one here in particular. Uh, unfortunately, I forgot to, to take a picture for some reason. I'm not sure why, but this is full of bubbles. Uh, we've compared with the same pour that uh, did use the heat can. So it, it does, uh, so the heat, it does help a lot. The heat can or the torch do help a lot these projects to, to pop the bubbles. And I think that most of the bubbles, they probably are coming also from the wood because I didn't have, was so many bubbles here that I don't recall having bubbles inside. When I was mixing, I tried, to mix very careful to don't to don't be that much. Uh, and finally, after finishing, right? So for this one, that's um, uh, was a uh, table board. So I, I just finished with a, a butt block to do it. Um, and this is bamboo. So it, it works really nice. After finish, uh, is really exposed the the box and so on. So it, it's um, I think it looks um, quite nice. So these are some of the projects. So these are the cutting boards that I have done. Oh, nice. Uh, this is, uh, this is the, the one that I was mentioning. Uh, was a little bit a big pour because it's a big, it's a relative big uh, design. Uh, on the same board on the opposite side, I, I did this one here, this small one here. One thing that you're gonna note here, that's a close up, and you can note in, in these ones here as well, is did you see that the, the pox kind of got between the fibers as well? Oh yeah. So I'm not sure how to solve this. I tried to, to tape some of the projects and see if that would help to see if um, uh, when you pour in with the, 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 the tape in, uh, when you do the laser with the tape on top, it means that the tape is gonna be protecting what's not there, right? It's not because of the smoke, but didn't help too much. So I'm not sure how to remove this one here, but it can get, and I'm guessing that's wider uh, the wood is easier to see it. Uh, the darker the wood, you're probably yeah. not going to notice this. But if it's a white wood like this bamboo, uh, you can clearly see it. It's yeah, I'm, I'm still playing to see what's the best way that you can do to avoid this 
to happen. And these are two cutting boards. Uh, so this was after the class uh, the, uh, in the wood, um, wood, the wood shop, there is a class for cutting boards. So I did myself some of them and I just did uh, some of the designs as well uh, to give uh, as present. Um, it's a real meat lover board there in the bottom right. Yeah, so, so <laughs> this, this in fact was a wedding gift, uh, this one here on, on the bottom uh -huh. right. So it uh, was a good friend of us, they were getting married. It was right before the lockdown in fact, but they got married. Uh, and I finished uh, that week as well. It was one of the uh, uh, last weeks that the shop and was open. In fact. Oh, yeah. Um, these are the, the coasters that I did. This I think was before I did the, um, the finishing here on the right or after the finishing, after they're cutting and the, the finishing um, as well. So I was, I was quite happy with the result. I think it's, uh, it looks, looks good. Uh, this was uh, finished with poly um, uh, as well. That's and great. Oh, I have a question. Those epoxies do not look clear. Did you color them with with uh, a powder? Was, was with the pigment, yes. With it's a powdered pig pigment. Well, with the powder pigment. So I was using like the small mixer, mixer cups. I was yeah. power, uh, pouring some of the pigments and that was by eye. I didn't measure the pigments. Just, just the resin that is one to one mix. Then the pigment itself is just like enough to have the color that uh, I wanted. Um, but was, was with the pigments, was with the color, it was the powder pigment. If I remember correctly, didn't they come with like 10 or 15 different colors of pigment, little yeah. packets? So it was a really yeah. nice variety. Yeah, yeah, it, it was very interesting colors as well. They, they had it. So not, not the new ones, right? That's in Amazon right now. Probably it's a shortage from the, yeah. from the situation right now. Um, but yeah, they, they used to have come with a lot of different ones um, uh, of this uh, powder pigments. Okay. Um, and this, uh, this one of the, one of the, the last ones that you did as well, this is a growth chart. And this is something to, to I just put this here because uh, to be aware. So you're going to see that the growth charts go a little, almost four feet. It's not because I expect my daughter to don't grow more than that. It's just because I didn't want to, for some reason, uh, to cut in two pieces and join together. I just want one whole piece and this was the maximum that I could put on the laser uh, on the green laser you can see that's even going a little bit further than the, the maximum but I was able to to um, uh, to laser edge this one one problem that I run that was quite interesting uh, and Travis where there you give you gave me the idea to how to solve this is because in here I was in the limit of the laser I was still able to etch but the laser will not allow me to etch it was given an error and after a brief discussion, we discovered that this part this, that's writing, uh, that's her name, Hannah here, uh, what happened here is because the laser was at maximum speed, after you pass the, the highest or the closest to the, to the corner uh, etching, it, the, laser, the laser needs to disaccelerate. And it was not able to disaccelerate because it was too fast. So to solve this, I put everything in the maximum speed because it was not the problem, but this particular part of the etching, I reduced the speed. Because the speed was lower, it, it, it needs a, a lower, um, um, or a, um, a not so long, a shorter um, acceleration um, uh, gap. And that was able to do it. So it's in the limits of the, 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 the machine, but was able to do it just because. So if you guys ever run into a problem like this, but we're <laughs> using the laser and the laser is not allowing it to etch because it's too close to the, to the corner, maybe if you reduce the speed of the, the laser etching, uh, it's going to need less uh, um, or going to be a shorter length to disaccelerate and that can, can allow it to do it. So it is the way that allow it to do it. Well, you, you definitely tested the limits. Yes, that was, that was exactly. <laughs> in the limit, yeah. And here was just a way to, this was just like a, a high speed um, uh, of the laser. You can see that's the that was just about taping just to see it how it is done. And it was quite interesting to see the burning of the laser. And you can see the, the, the lights kind of blinking just because of the probably of oscillation of the alternate current. Um, so this was. Um, after uh, after I put the 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 box and I put different the boxes here and this after we put the wall uh, here as well. So 
it did work well. Again, one thing that uh, for this particular project that I would um, uh, uh, mention that was a little bit challenging is because, can you see uh, this, um, how, how's the name of this part of the wood here is, is coming out? Um, it's kind of a, hmm? Not. Not, exactly. So the knot, uh, because it's a different kind of density of the wood and so on, the etching on that part was different, was shallow. So when I test, I test on the, the part that was the most homogeneous, but when I did the, the etching here it was shallow. So what happened is after sanding, uh, some of these parts kind of become very, very shallow because it, the laser was not deep enough on that. So if uh, you're working through different woods, the same projects, just be aware of that because you, you, may, you may need to, this is a problem, it's not a problem that you're gonna have in a CNC machine, but on the laser, uh, in different kind of wood, you, can, you may have different depths as well. So I always keep that in mind as well if you're using. Um, I think this is my last slide, yes. Um, I don't know, uh, Lance, do you wanna take over from here? So Lance? Sure. Thank you very okay. much, Luciano. Yeah, thanks. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I just have no, that's fine. Let me just uh, switch this over to you, though. Hold on. Yeah, what do I need to request? No, no, no. I just need to uh, spotlight you. And I just have to look for a virtual background. Oh, yeah, that guy right there. Let's spotlight you. OK. Uh, let's see. OK. So. I just have a tour of a few things that I've done and we have, I don't know. Okay, what is everyone looking at? We're looking at your epoxy S and T slide. Okay, so you can see then the photos. So this is, okay. So I'm just gonna go through the couple of things where I've used this on. Um, I don't have, I've used art resin, which is more expensive, but I was also toying with originally, and it's like, it'll be towards the end of what I actually used it for, um, things to cover art or things that were painted or, or made. So um, it's supposed to not degrade in like UV light and it's clear. And they also have another set of uh, colors and the one thing I liked about that is they are not powder, it's liquid. So it's a little bit more expensive, like I said, but uh, I just found it easier. They come in little dropper bottles and um, you kind of mix it like just like acrylic paint. Um, so, so this was- So as, as was implied by Mary, yours is clear, is that right? Yeah, so- Okay. Uh, well, so, so what do you mean? As opposed to what we saw with Cassiano's, he used pigment and it was a sort of a cloudy epoxy. A beautiful right. color, that's, but still not trans. That's right. And the way that one works, and I don't have a picture of it, I can bring up a web page, but you basically get all these colors and then white, right? And so if you want it to be translucent, you use the colors. Ah. If you want it to be uh, opaque and colored, you add white and then whatever color you want. Got it. Got it. Okay, so I you'll see on this one. So this was the this is just from IKEA. This is just a starting point. So my idea, uh, I wanted a tulip table, uh, but I wasn't gonna spend five hundred bucks for a uh, knockoff that I was gonna rip apart. So finally, I found at IKEA. They sell this. I don't know what it is now, but it was like a hundred and seventy-five bucks or something. I got it for the base, and I said I'm gonna make a top for this. So I made a top and you can see here, this picture shows this giant knot. Oh, yeah. and so there's a couple other ones that are, uh, you'll probably not see in the details, but are also subtly um, part of the project. Also the chair plays into this and you'll notice a theme throughout. I love orange. So um, <laughs> the idea was to fill this with orange to match the chair. So, and so um, after I got the top cut out, I taped it up. Um, I've since actually, this is something I jotted down to mention and I'll show you, I don't have a picture of it for the other projects, but I found that using a heat gun, uh, not a heat gun, sorry, um, hot glue, hot glue gun is a great way to separate the uh, section. So where Castiano was showing those Game of Thrones coasters, 
Uh, if you just get, I mean, they're super cheap, they're readily available. If you just pump like a bead of hot glue around the design, it kind of makes a well. And that way, if you, you can kind of be a little bit overzealous with your pour. Um, it is annoying if you have too much, but it's your own fault at least. And uh, <laughs> I just found that that sort of, uh, it, it's, it's, it kind of prevents any, anything from spilling over. So that's so basically a dam wall. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So here, I mean, these were spaced apart. Um, what I did was on the bottom, which you don't see here on this side is um, where there's a, like on the knot, it's actually, I used, I think it's HVAC tape, um, but it's metal, it's like aluminum, I don't know if it's aluminum, but it's metal tape. So it's really thin metal tape. So um, you put that on the bottom. Ideally, what I've learned since, actually you can see a piece of it. Uh, you can see the cursor here. So this, this oh, is yeah. the tape. You can use that on the edges to make a dam as well. Um, a piece so, uh, that's big, go ahead. Let's any particular reason to use this tape in particular or? Uh, so this tape is super malleable. Mm, okay. so it's very thin and it's strong as long as you don't puncture it. So, um, I, you know, I have it laying around. It, it's, um, you can roll it out. So what, I don't know if it's in any of the pictures, but I have a, a roller, like a plastic uh, hard roller. And so it works really well with that because it'll form to whatever you need it to. Um, so that's kind of uh, useful. One thing that I have learned since, and it's not, like I was saying, it's not easy to do on a piece this large, but you, if you, to deal with the bubble situation, um, ultimately the bubbles go to the top, right? So if you can, you can actually do it upside down if, if possible. You do it upside down so that as long as you have it flat underneath, the bubbles are going to go to the top, which is the bottom. So then you can flip it. Again, yeah. for, for a kitchen table or something, this a lot of these things kind of depend on um, whether or not, you know, the size of the piece and what you're doing. But that's another kind of tip that I learned since where, you know, if you can flip it. So I just have some pictures here. Like there's nothing on the other side of this. These were so thin that there's nothing to tape. Um, but I still wanted to fill all the details that I could just to kind of um, get as many little orange pieces as I could. Mm -hmm. So afterwards, you can see here, there's like some here. Um, this is obviously like this, this showcase. And honestly, it's not as bright as I would have liked. Um, I'll show you some like testing ones I did later just randomly. Um, but it's, it's subtle, so it's nice. Um, the lighting also obviously affects it. But um, you can see here, you know, you have the knot and those are a couple other little bits around and I use the same color here. And it, again, it's, it all depends on the camera, the computer, and the light. Um, so it's not like... Together. Right. So that, okay. that's, that probably kind of just sums it up there. Um, yeah. Very nice. So these were, this is just an idea. I was just kind of trying to come up with idea. At this point I got like, I was like, what can I pour resin into and make colors with, you know? And I've had a nice break from that. So I think this might uh, take me back, but uh, this was, uh, so these are actually hooks you'll see, uh, but I just took these as a drill press, made little um, hooks and there's the, you can see the metallic tape. So in this case, they kind of actually bowed in a little bit, so the flatness wouldn't work. That was like ready to pour them, and then I, there's the other side with the tape. And like I said, that's actually not ideal. So if I was gonna do the reverse trick, you'd want those to be flat. I, I think I pushed down too hard, but yeah. um, I just colored them, you know, made green and yellow ones. And then um, they're just, those are for the kitchen. Um, so I, I put, uh, I forgot what these are called now. It's escaping me, but they're basically double-ended screws. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I had a picture of them hanging, but uh, I put a T-nut in the side of a cabinet and those are hanging with like a colander on it, you know. Um, so in this project, I was making a, I took a lamp that they sold at Ikea that was yellow and it was like a, a desk lamp. 
and I wanted to put it on the wall. And so to do that, part of it was to make like a base for it. So we started with this piece and that was what I had like routed out. And I wanted there, there was a crack in the side that I wanted to keep like the, the, the knot there, but I wanted it to like kind of just be a, again, it's kind of like the table, just an accent to match the lamp. So I filled that and then sanded it and used, you know, hand planes and whatnot. That's the, you'll, you see, that's the base that I created, yeah. to redo it. Um, you know, it sat on a, a desk, so. And then, so th there's like the, you know, again, just a little detail there to match the lamp. Cool. This was, this isn't as exciting. This was a desk I designed that's based on like, uh, there's a side table from like the fifties that, forget the guy's name now, it's been a while, but there's side tables that look like that. So I made a desk, which is actually what I'm sitting at now. And there were some knots in it. This isn't exciting because I just mixed, uh, this is, just clear epoxy with a bunch of walnut dust in it, and it actually turns black. Um, so there were, I used, you know, I OCD'd all the grain and everything, but I wanted to use these nice pieces that I had that had these gaps. So I just filled it in and it just darkened it in really nice. Was your intention um, to have it be the same color as the majority of the wood and you ended up with something really dark or did you know what you were gonna get? No, I did. I mean. I, yeah, I didn't use color on purpose. Um, it was basically with the, with the uh, sawdust. Did you get darker than you expected? Is what I'm curious. Yes. About. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking. At it, it it turned black. But yeah. the nice thing is, it actually does. I mean, you. This is that. This picture actually is almost. I would say it's almost misleading. I mean, it actually blends in perfectly. Good. It looks uh, just like you wouldn't know that there was like. Um, I mean, it kind of. You know, here, I think there's like here, here, and here, you know, and if you're, again, it kind of depends on the camera and the light or whatever, but it really just looks like it's part of the, how the, the wood turned out. Cool. Um, this is, again, this is, again, the let's pour epoxy on everything. I had painted this, <laughs> I had painted this like 12 years ago or something, uh, maybe more. And I was like, oh, this would look way cooler if it were shiny. So, um, but this is just to show, I think that's one of my favorite pictures of all of this, where you just dump like a whole bunch of it on there and uh -huh. it starts to look amazing. Um, this is why I got the torch. Okay, so I had a heat gun and I went to Home Depot. They have it, or maybe I were on Amazon, I don't know. But I got a torch because of the size of this. And the torch is better for larger pieces, I think. If you're doing something like those posters that Cassiano showed, you, the torch is overkill. I mean, well, it also depends. They do make creme brulee size torches. Right. So you can get like the artist torch. I've seen those that are the same price as like the actual, I mean, I use this torch to light the, like the grill that I have you know what I mean so it just kind of depends on so I wasn't going to get something that the heat gun could do but for this project I decided to get the big torch and I think it works really well because you just can't cover the space with the heat gun and also moving it around it doesn't move the, uh, the epoxy around so you can kind of see some of these are hard to tell but you can see by the light reflection you know and I mean that's it looks great. Dr. Mario's, again, you can't really tell from the photo, but it's very glossy. Another old Let's piece of... Let's, right. uh, just, just before I go, it looks really nice. Uh, so you, di you didn't fence it, right? So you just pour... No, yeah, I taped this one, actually. If you see the blue, this has blue okay. tape. There's okay. blue tape on the edges of this one. But the blue tape is a little bit above the, the edge, or... The same uh, no, well, it so I tried to not let it go over. Okay. So with this stuff, um, you, you know, you can. Oh, what did I get? I do have. I don't have a picture of it, but they're like uh, they're tools. It's just a piece of plastic. You could three D print it, and I probably would if I, you know, mm -hmm. went back in time and had a three D printer then. But it just has like teeth at the end of it, mm -hmm. uh, like little 
there's just different sized teeth. And I use that and you pour it in the middle. That's actually why. So I have this, I mean, that's everything that's used. Oh, okay. I poured it in the middle. I didn't add anything else. And then you're basically spreading it. So like a rake? Um, yeah, ish. I mean, and you're pushing it to the edge. And when you get to the edge, you kind of lift it up. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and you're, you're kind of making a bead almost. I don't know if that's the right word, but you're, you're pushing it up to the edge. Mm -hmm. And so like, honestly, like there's one, I, I know right now I can walk over to the thing and show you that like, I screwed that up up here and there's a little glob that has blue tape stuck underneath it <laughs> because it went, you know, went over. Um, and I got mo most of it up, but there's like a little bit that fell over. But the idea here was not to pour it over the edge. Hey Lance, quick question. What did you use to spread it out with? Uh, can I, I don't know. Can you don't have to change like anything. Yeah, that's fine. Can you see what I'm doing right yes. now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Browser tab. I just used an old expired credit card. <laughs> okay, that works too. One of these things. So I, I will tell you, I, I've worked with Dallas a lot on epoxy, and one of the tips that he taught me on a large surface spreading epoxy out was a rubber squeegee like they like you would clean a shower with. Mm -hmm. Home oh, Depot for like Ikea, has, Ikea has those super cheap. Yeah. 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 So okay. you get you can get them for like 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, and they're really good about spreading uh, epoxy out. And you get a lot less bubbles when you use that squeegee too. Okay. So I would say I would use both. If you told me that, I would say, because you know why this is really good for the edge. This is what's yes. really good for the edges because this is how you can, you basically scrape it to the edge and then lift it and you can get that like bead again. I don't know if there's a better word, but uh, without going over. So that makes total sense to, if you want to use that to start with when you're kind of in the middle, right. um, you know, when you have this glob, that yeah. would make sense. And Ikea has those. I know because I have one of my shower. Yep. And they, they, they're probably three bucks or something. Right. Um, and then when you get to the edge to use one of their spreaders, you know, some places, I don't know where, but I saw these for like 10 bucks or something on Amazon. It was crazy. But you can get them for like, it should be like $2 or something. You can find them. Um, and that worked really well. That's a good So on the torch that you were using, did you use the, the pencil point or a, I've seen them that have more of a wide funnel that, spread the heat it is whatever came with it i got the okay. uh what is it uh benzo benzomatic burnzomatic yes yeah yeah it's triggerless or uh, yeah. trigger fire no don't have to worry about matches and that yeah stuff. and it came with map gas i honestly i took that off i use that when i, I have like well, a big green egg kind of kamado grill when i'm lighting that i use the map gas because the whole point of that is that it's hotter yeah, that's, way more was another question, yeah. I don't, I mean, the propane tanks are like $2 a piece. I yeah. think the map gas ones are 10 or something. So yeah. I took that off. I used the map gas to light the grill because it happens way quicker. I don't think, uh, someone mentioned it before, you know, the heat isn't, like the, the amount of heat isn't that critical. It's really just some heat to get the bubbles up. So right. I just got some propane and I used the propane to do this. Perfect. Um, yeah. And so this is just another, like, this was laying around from something I made in college, like, a, but it just, you can see the, how fun and shiny it is once you make, you know, pour epoxy all over it. So some, I just brought it back to life. Um, these were some random Pac-Man art that I, this is before I had a CNC machine, but it was just an idea of like trying to play around with it, which is why I, um, so he, here's actually here. Perfect. So this is actually before I poured both that paper. This is paper. It's just colored paper, which has a, you know, you'll see there's an issue with that. Um, and the setup that I have to just um, do those little uh, hooks, right? So I set this up, obviously temporary setup. And the nice thing about this stuff, because it's like, it, it's supposed to be for like crafting and stuff. And again, it's a little bit more expensive, but it doesn't have like, uh, noxious fumes so you can actually use it inside is that like uh, a lumen light 
Have you heard of that as a no. two-part resin? No, it's called art resin. Art resin, um, okay. Thanks. Yeah, and again, like their whole thing is like it's supposed to be non-toxic. I don't know about non-toxic, but you know, way less toxic than like the marine stuff you can just get if you, you know, if you are buying like West, you know, and all that. So, and it's not, I, I'm not trying to be organic or anything, but the whole deal is it's supposed to uh, be um, also very good for UV and, and easy to work with. It has like an hour open time of 45 minutes. And so just starting out, it's like when I first started making my workbench, I bought the like uh, tight bond extended, you know, I just got a gallon of that because it had like an hour work time and I knew I was doing all this stuff by hand. So I would just appreciate the extra time. So, um, yeah. and yeah, that's, that's the torch. So it's, I did use the map gas, I guess, the first time, but eventually I went out and got some propane. In a, in a previous slide, it looked as though you had a vinyl cutter in the background. Is that what you used to cut these characters? Yeah, right. So these are, right. Which I wish now that the laser's available, you can kind of do with wood, but the CNC machine, you can't cut on shapes like this. It yeah, but the vinyl it. cutters are amazing. So I was just curious. Yeah. So, um, so the, and you'll see, these are paper, which is not ideal because you'll see it bleeds uh, it bled through here. So yeah. that was kind of part of the issue. Um, but I've actually tried to figure that out. And there's some stuff you can put on it first. Uh, kind of like um, Mod Podge-ish stuff to seal it better. Um, here's, some, you know, this is just a an idea of where I was going with that. But this is actually the test that I did. So I, I, I saved, I put that in here. It's not very exciting, but you can see you, know, you can make a little square and kind of figure out what's going on. And though this is the stuff that I ended up using for obvious reasons, because right. some of these were like rubber cement, like this is rubber cement. Um, and so I found some stuff where it won't bleed through. Again, just like you can make anything fun and shiny. And orange. Exactly. Themes here. <laughs> You know, and like this piece is in the garage and eventually it's gonna end up with something. Um, the one other thing I had, which had its own little album here, which I will, if, uh, all right. So this was the old, I, I had used the hand router to do this actually, which I'm like, um, I was later more impressed with the, that, um, but let's see. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so that's what was there. So those were laser cut, and then I hand routed. Oh, I don't need it to do it by itself. All right. So that the the sun had destroyed the uh, plinth, I guess, that I made, and hand routed around those. So it was time to make a new one. So I found this technique to do. It's actually pretty awesome. It kind of makes like a hound's tooth design using plywood. Yeah. So you cut it into strips and then cut it into strips and then cut it into strips and then after gluing and gluing. So I routed out, I used the CNC and a V bit to route out the numbers. And so here, this is the recess that I had. And then got a little fun detail down there. So that was ultimately what came off the CNC. And then I poured epoxy and I did this. I know I don't have anything in between. So I used the hot glue around here and it worked really well. You can see it did bleed through a little bit. And so this is the worst. I mean, it kills me right now to look at this, but you can prevent this to uh, a little bit by, I got sprays. I've done something since this. And I don't have pictures of it, but spray a little bit of shellac. Mm -hmm. Shellac or super glue. Yeah, ex yeah. And so with this, here's the deal. This is plywood, right? And this is the edge of plywood. So it's almost like a nightmare. It's asking for this, you know, <laughs> because each of these, like, uh, for example, if you really look um, where it's bad, I mean, there's, there's actual gaps, you know, and, it's, and this is Baltic birch, so there's no voids. But the, even though there's no void, there's still going to be, you know, even if it's just from the CNC machine, uh, they're going to, it's going to rip a piece out or whatever. So 
but you know you can stand and and go crazy and um, ultimately it came out real pr pretty good um congrats yeah so uh after finishing it it, it looked way better great uh, and then it looks pretty good this we'll see how it holds up at this time yeah right um i may need to switch to uh mosaics because <laughs> i don't think anything natural like it has to be metal or, or tile or something at this point with the, the sun but um so yeah but I'm, I'm i'm real happy with how this turned out and kind of like the, it's an alternative to the laser i guess the one thing i thought of with the laser when cassiano was speaking was um, maybe again spray like sand it first and then use the can like the shellac can that I got I would never use it to finish something I don't even remember the brand but it's like I think it's five bucks at Home Depot and I think if you just give it one, like after if you just sand off the smoke and you spray it once it'll probably help keep uh, from because I know what you mean about the pigment mixing in you know, especially if you're using the powdered stuff where it's kind of like, um, has that like, I don't know what the word is, opalescence, I guess. Um, so to avoid that, you might want to just try spraying it with some of that shellac. Yeah, good idea. I think, it's, it's, yeah, I think it's a great tip. Uh, I haven't thought about shellac. I, I work a lot of with poly. I thought oh, maybe poly, but shellac I think is, a, is better. Yeah, it would be better to that. Another thing about the 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 the, the, the color uh, the pigments that's different from the uh, the colors that they're using oh. is because I noticed that they don't mix co completely clean. It's not a, a mix completely clean when you do it with the resin. I think it's, there is a little bit of a gradient from time to time. So when you're mixing colors, I've had better luck with liquid tints. Um, I go to yeah. T H and I buy the trans tint. Um, they have 15 primary colors, and they really uh, blend well with the epoxy. And you can get a lot of different cool colors with the trans tint. Does that give you a clear, a clear uh, resin then when you're done? Yeah, you yeah. I use clear resin and then just tint it with the trans tint with the uh, color that I want. So right. I'll make a small sample of resin and I'll add drops until I get the color that I want. And then I know the ratio of, you know, grams of resin to how many drops of a uh, trans tint that I need when I mix it. So you can recreate a color because you've taken note of what the mix is? You, whenever you work with this, you should always, like anything in finishing, you should always keep a notebook of what you do for each project so you can go back and replicate it later on. So if I have a particular color, like I'm working on a live edge slab table and I have a bunch of little warm bowls and stuff that I'm filling in. So I know how many drops of trans tint to how many grams of resin so I can replicate that and it will be the same throughout the project. Cool. Yeah. I just brought this up. This is the like liquid, you see their little bottles. And so basically if you use any of these, on their own, they're going to give you this like translucent kind of, but then if you add the white, it uh, then makes it a solid, uh, which is what, so all the stuff that I used uh, had the white in it. Got it. Cool. Anything else, Lance? Nope. That was great. That was great. So we heard from the comments from people that uh, we have <clears throat> others who have been doing this. And uh, let's see if we can do a little round table here. Who would like to be the next person, if you'd like to, to show some of your work? I would, because I need to leave. OK, let's get you up here, Mary. Let me get you on here. I, I don't know if the screen, share screen, if I just bring photos up on my screen and I share my screen. Really at at the up. top of your screen, you should be able to see a share screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, when you do that, it'll show you all of your open applications. You just choose the one you want to share with us, and we'll see that. But what if I don't have an application? I just open up. Oh, then you can just show us your desktop in general. Okay. All right. So this is actually something that I've fairly recently done. And in this case, I actually made a mold uh, out of melamine 
coated plywood or whatever. And, uh, and then I use packing tape, clear packing tape, and I lined that mold. And then I put in a piece of wood that was like a knot off of the side of the tree. And uh, it was about two inches thick at the thickest. And then I started pouring resin. And I don't know if you can see, but I poured different color for every layer. Layer. Yeah, yeah. So on this side of the board, it looks like blue. And on this side, it's like Oh, blue. cool. Yeah. And well, um, so you this know what's is fun, Mary, with what you've done there is every example so far has been putting resin into wood. You've put wood into resin. Into resin, exactly. <laughs> the one thing I have no idea is I don't know how this stuff is going to hold up to a knife or forks or whatever, you know, if you're actually using it for cheese and crackers. So I, I have no idea, but it's kind of cute. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. I mean, it's wood. just a chunk of wood that I didn't want to throw away and I couldn't really do anything with it. So cool. How much resin do you think you used on that? Um, maybe two cups. But two. this particular resin, I'm using what's called countertop countertop uh, epoxy, and um, it it finishes clear. It was made, you know, to coat the countertop of bars and things like that. Um, my pigment, I just use acrylic pigment from Michael's. Oh. And, and I just mix the color that I want. And like, if you want the same color, you need to pick a recipe. <laughs> but yeah, so I just mix the different color each day. So each layer is a different day for. Okay. Mary, or you use a moss resin? I'm using countertop epoxy. I know, but is, is the manufacturer Moss, M-A-S? I don't know. Okay. I thought it was just Countertop Epoxy. That's what I go to, countertopepoxy.com. Okay. And um, one thing I found on this particular pour was there were a couple of little holes, and literally bubbles would come up out of those holes for over a half an hour, 45 minutes, <laughs> and, and then they'd sink. You know, I finally get tired of blowing those, I mean, putting the heat on those bubbles and I'd walk away and I'd come back the next day and there'd be a sinkhole. <laughs> <laughs> In one case, I, I mean, I just had to pour it like five times before that finally filled up, which is amazing. So I don't know, you know, in the future, maybe I'll experiment and see if I sealed it somehow first, if I, I could avoid that because the air just kept coming and coming and coming. I was like like yeah. shop. One day I spent 20 minutes trying to get this one bubble to stop coming up. <laughs> so that's that's a pour in a mold. Um, let's see if I can get. So for for this one, Mary, just before you go move forward, what was the the finest uh, grit that you used to sand out that? that say, say again. What so, grit so, did you use for sanding? You know, on this, I actually poured quite a bit of extra, and I had some extra wood. I started out with 80 grit and just worked my way down, all the way to 400, 600, whatever. Oh, okay. So, so okay. the maximum was. See this table? Uh, not yet. No. No. No, we don't. You have to go up to the top and uh, share screen. Uh, Cassiano, you just did that. Can you can you correct me if I describe it wrong? What does it's she at do? the bottom on mine. So, yeah. I, I oh, 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 mine was on the bottom as well. Okay, so just fine. like there's a, a green button, say uh, share screen. So okay, you could press that. It's right next to the chat button, Mary. Yep. Listen to yeah. Doug. Woo! <laughs> I already clicked it, but I lost you guys. I, I don't have, I don't have, wait a minute. Go down to the bottom. Okay, okay, and sure. look for your, your little camera. So if you're using a Mac, you, you may need to do exactly what I did. But you need to open the, the system. So there's a link to open the system and allow it to share the screen. Otherwise, the Mac cannot allow the, to share the screen. So that's okay, what was happening. That. Where do I find that? So if you screen share screen, it should pop up a, uh, a small window saying that you need to go to all system preference. And I think there is a link there that you can click. And when you click. Um, what happens, Mary, when you click on share screen? 
Oh, I see. Okay, let's try that. Ah, yes. Okay. Oh, there's Lindsay. <laughs> there's my daughter. So this is the <laughs> table that I made for her last year, and you can see I did what um, Lance did. did. Yeah. <laughs> but these holes, these holes went all the way through mm. the slab, and so I taped off the bottom with the silver duct tape or whatever it is. That's really, really sticky duct duct tape. And um, before I poured the blue um, resins, I put a clear coat of epoxy over the whole board so that the blue wouldn't soak in where I didn't want blue. Got it. And then, so then the big holes were left and I just kept filling, filling those. And in this case, I had to fill two or three times over two or three days because the board was almost two inches thick. Oh. And the epoxy is not supposed to be more than a quarter of an inch thick. That's the epoxy that I was using. So that's that, count, that, that countertop epoxy is food safe, by the way. Okay. And by I, looking on their website. On the side over here, this, this was a large gap, and that got all filled through also. Now, when you're using a slab like this, it may look like it may look like the hole doesn't go through to the other side, but sometimes the hole is on the other side way in a different place. Mm -hmm. And so I did large swaths of tape on the underside and I didn't have any problem with this, with this core, with it um, blowing out in unwanted places. Anyway, so, so that was one use. Judging from the colors of the carpets, uh, Lindsay's outfit, your current shirt, and the color of the epoxy, you like blue. I like blue and green and purple, yeah. <laughs> but somehow with wood, that color of water, oh yeah, somehow, it just sort of looks good with wood, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's two more pictures I want to show you. I got to bring them up here. Oh, hold on. Oh, there's another one. This one. Take this over here. Okay, so this was a bowl, and I had rough turned the bowl, and there was this large void, and so I needed to make some sort of a dam. This was actually my first use of resin, and I had to make a oh. dam somehow on a curved surface. It was a little difficult and I tried hot glue, I tried different masking tapes and the resin somehow melted the stickiness on most masking tapes. And that's yeah. when I discovered that the silver duct tape, that they have a really sticky silver duct tape that's thicker and I had to use it on the bowl. And of course, I had to turn this up on its edge and um, pour a really thick resin to fill that whole hole and then take it back to the lathe and turn it round again. Hmm. So that that's another use. Did you, did you know the void was there before you did the rough turn? I knew it was there before, but I didn't know how deep it went in. Yeah. And so I, I chose to partially turn it first. Yeah. It's very distinct. Yeah. And that's my experience with resin. Didn't you have one more? Do I? I thought you said you had two more. That was just one. No, no, that's no? it. No, okay. two more pictures. It was two more pictures. Oh, I see. Great. Great. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And it was nice seeing everybody. Maybe I'll see. Is it two weeks from today? Yeah, we'll shoot for that. I'll bring, I'll bring my uh, molds that I'm using for my large cutting boards, like I did for this one, but much larger. Cool. See you then. Thanks. Uh -huh. Or see you 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. The uh, I want to see your holiday. Holiday project. Holiday gift sale. Oh, I have to drop that off tomorrow. <laughs> Saturday. Tomorrow's, Saturday. 
Tomorrow's no, no, this, this is this yeah, is the Friday right. get together with uh, Dan. Oh, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I'm 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 losing it. Back to back <laughs> zooms. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> see you in the morning. We'll see you tomorrow, Mary. Who else do we have that would like to share some stuff? Uh, Doug's got to have something. I'm not ready tonight. Thanks. Not tonight. Okay. Who else? Anybody? Next time. I, I think oh. I just I, I didn't know what this was going to be all about, but with the resin and all, I had a project uh, that I built a boat out of uh, cedar and fiberglass resins, and you know, to a real a real boat. A real boat. Uh, okay. It's an Adirondacks guide boat, and I have it. I don't know if I can get a picture of it or not. Well, can you look for the picture and we'll, we'll come back as soon as you find it? Yeah, no, here it is. Okay, good. Well, now, how do I get it off of my phone to... Oh, well, that's a bit your screen. Uh, yeah, just hold the phone up to the computer. Oh, there's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, just so, hold it up to your camera. So the, the bulk of it is uh, cedar, eastern and western cedar. And... You guys were talking about the bubbles. I, I didn't didn't know what a bubble was in in uh, this case, but to keep from adding a lot of uh, extra weight to the boat, uh, I was I wanted to only one sheet of uh, fiberglass in the in inside and keep it on a fairly on the rough side. I didn't. Usually with the fiberglass uh, cloth, uh, yeah. When you keep adding more and more fiberglass, the 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 clearer and clearer it gets, mm. which also means you've added weight to it. Right. Uh, so, so did you find the picture on your phone? Can you show it to us? Oh, can you see it? Hold it up higher. We can't see it yet. Oh, there we are. Yep. That's that's the the. The boat. So is it two benches for two? Is it a, is it also a row? It it's um it's a sixteen foot boat. It's it's double ended just like a canoe. It looks like a canoe. Move it a little bit more to your right, please. There you go. Yeah. So um, where was I? <laughs> okay. Um, Double-ended canoe-like. Oh, yes, it's, it's called an Adirondacks guideboat. Okay. Uh, they were popular in the late 1800s, up in the Adirondacks lakes of New York. And the object was, uh, you would you would hire the boat out like a a cab or a or I don't know. I guess you could rent the boat, but usually you rented a boat. And he, he rode you across the lake and then came back empty and picked up somebody else. Taxi service. And they would, yes, and they would have races coming back because they didn't have a client necessarily. So you wanted a fast, fast boat if you could, if you could tweak it. So I spent a, a year uh, building the guide boat in my basement in New England, in uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, that's great. We have other boat uh, makers that you should probably meet, like uh, Mike McElney, who specializes in skulls and kayaks and things like that. Um, yeah, we should we should connect you up with people. Not a lot of people are bold enough to actually undertake something like that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, Sounds I was like another sig. Yeah, I can there you go. <laughs> mm. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Who else has something they'd like to share? It's fine um, if nobody does, but that's the... I Go, I, Marty. I have a question on how everybody um, gets the right proportion of the re resin and the epoxy or whatever. I mean, like, I'm always mixing very, very small amounts because I'm filling just little things, and I have, I have this little... I'm going to put this up. I don't know if you can see it. A little scale. Yeah. A little scale. Um, um, Marty, because of the background you're using, yeah. put it like in, in front of your like uh, face. There. Yeah, that's good. That's good. We can see that. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So it's cool. got a scale. 
and you can have a tear so you can put Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put a cup on it. And then I drip some rosin in, or the hardener, mm -hmm. and weigh it. And then I multiply that by five and add it to the original weight. And they fill the, the epoxy until it's full. So it sounds like you're paper. using the formula that they tell you about. It sounds like it would work perfectly, doesn't it? It's perfect. Oh, okay. Okay, got it. And it's and it helps with very small amounts. Because I'm I always need like two tablespoons. <laughs> okay. So it's a digital scale that just measures really small weights, huh? Yeah, the max that it'll weigh is fifty grams. Oh wow, okay, okay, cool. Great. Do you have any examples of your work to show us? Those two teaspoon sized projects? No, well, I have a let's see if this will work. I have a box, a bandsaw box. Yeah. Oh, there we have some. Is it showing up? Can yep. you see? So it had a lot of gaps, and I just filled them up, and it put uh, tape on the backside so it didn't run through, and filled the when the epoxy was in there. I put in, or no, I put in uh, crushed stone first, and then poured the epoxy on it. Do you usually use epoxy to fill voids? Is that your primary use? Yeah. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Do we have anybody else on the call who'd like to show something? Any other boats out there? Rob has been exceedingly quiet. Rob is not usually this quiet on a call. Uh, I don't do anything epoxy yet. I, <laughs> I, I laid in to sit there and watch. And, uh, so Are you feeling well, inspired now? Yep. Yeah. Good, good. All right, well, if there isn't anybody else, we'll go ahead and wind this down, but uh, special thanks to Lance and Cassiano, because if we did not have them stepping forward, we wouldn't have had the catalyst to have the first of these meetings. So uh, thanks, guys, for putting so much time and effort into it. And in the future, uh, hopefully we'll have Doug show us some things, which would be really great. And I have this feeling that uh, both Mary and Marty and others have plenty of other examples to show us. So um, we'll schedule one of these things around the corner. Any other questions or comments before we wind it down? No? Very quiet bunch. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thank you guys for attending. Thank you. See you again in a couple of weeks. Have a good bye. night. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. All right, bye-bye.